everyone. My name is Rebecca Jones, aka Miss Informational, and you are joining us for, I think, our fourth podcast episode in this series. And I am here with the amazing, the incredible Dr. Cindy Banyai. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. I just cannot wait to see what you have in store for us this week. I know. We had a very saucy episode last week. So if you haven't caught that yet, go back. And so one of the ways we've heard this podcast series is to make it informational too. So like the first episode was almost just talking about what is disinformation? Yeah. How is it spread? What are the tactics and tools? Second episode, we got into a lot of the kind of information, misinformation that was prevalent at the time. Our third one had to do with a lot of breaking news and how that information could be spread. And this one I should have dubbed it our special COVID episode. Ooh. Because one of the viral misinformation stories of the week came from, of course, if you're talking about COVID-19 lies and disinformation, there's one person who always comes to mind, and that's Ron DeSantis. Oh. So, yeah, I know. So this week, Ron DeSantis made this exact statement. Almost every study now has said with these new boosters, you're more likely to get infected with the bivalent, that's what he called it, booster, which is, of course, false. And I discovered in trying to gather as much as many citations as possible to prove this false that the FDA has started a rumor control page that explains to you what the current kind of lies are that are going on with COVID-19, vaccines, monkeypox, all that kind of stuff, and how to prevent yourself from becoming an agent of misinformation. And as we've discussed several times, misinformation is when you share something that's not true, but you don't necessarily know that it's not true. But if you see a meme and you share it and you had no idea that the content of the meme was false, that's more misinformation. It's about intent. Disinformation is when you intentionally share something that is incorrect to other people. So whoever made that false meme, if they knew it was not true, is the person who was spreading disinformation. And Ron DeSantis is, if nothing, if not a walking example of COVID-19 disinformation from start to finish. But yeah, so, they do now have a rumor control website, which I was not aware of because they've been poorly advertising it. But it does combat a lot of these specific questions that have been popped up. One of which is really bizarre, but apparently at some point somebody started a rumor that the COVID-19 vaccines cause monkeypox. And so they have a section down here fact checking that claim. I was like, I didn't oh. hear that one. I must have missed, that, missed one. that one. Yeah. I did want to just back up just so folks who are listening. So you said that the that Ron DeSantis made this claim that everyone all the studies have shown something that people are getting the sick from the yes, vaccine. The bivalent booster. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what that is, just so people know? So the most recent round of boosters that have been available are the bivalent boosters. And we're going to show you that little video about it from the FDA explaining exactly what it is. Before authorizing the updated bivalent vaccines for use as a booster dose, FDA evaluated the totality of available scientific evidence. This included data on safety and immune response from clinical studies in adults receiving a dose of a bivalent COVID-19 vaccine that included a component of the original strain and a component of the BA1 Omicron variant. FDA also considered the real-world experience of the many millions of people who have received the original vaccines, including during the Omicron waves of COVID-19. There is a lot of misinformation about the new COVID-19 bivalent vaccines, and this misinformation is dangerous to public health. The bivalent COVID-19 vaccines are manufactured using the same process as the original vaccines and include two components, a component of the original virus strain to provide broad protection against COVID-19 and a component of the Omicron variant to provide better protection against COVID-19 caused by the Omicron variants that are currently causing most infections. The COVID-19 vaccines approved or authorized in the U.S. do not contain eggs, gelatin, latex, metals, or preservatives, and do not contain any live virus. The vaccines cannot cause COVID-19. Getting a bivalent vaccine booster dose is critical to help protect yourself against the most severe outcomes of COVID-19, including hospitalization and death. So please consider getting your updated vaccine soon. 
but it's essentially combines a couple of different vaccines and strains of COVID-19 attenuated viruses. So they're not live viruses to immunize you from the Omicron variant. And when you can do Moderna or Pfizer, either one, some people became teams during this whole thing, which was bizarre, but uh, it's just an updated booster shot. So every year you get your flu shot, or at least you should, and you, if you haven't, you're probably part of the problem. And there's usually a flu booster that you can take later on in the year. It's the same concept. It's basically that the virus can change and mutate so quickly that in order to be immunized from whatever's going around right now, you need to stay current with a vaccine that actually helps you be immunized from whatever's out there right now. Because the vaccines that we got in the very early phases of the vaccine release in 2021, where if you were lucky, end of 2020, we're rich in Florida and Republican, then that was for the old alpha and beta type of the virus. And so, of course, we're all the way on Omicron now, and we have different types of var variants out there. And so it's important to stay up to date so that you're, you don't want to become immunized by getting sick. There are unknown long-term consequences of that from cardiovascular impacts to neurological problems. And it, it lasts a lot. Ugh. All right. This is me being cute and saying that, you know, I, I'm a dork and sometimes I get tongue tied. So there it is. But yeah, uh, the long-term impacts of long COVID are still being studied, but we know that there are cardiovascular problems. There are neurological issues with long COVID. So you do not want to become immunized through infection. And the period of immunity is shorter for that than it is for if you continue to get your boosters on schedule. And so it's really important that you stay up to date. And of course, for the last year and a half, Ron DeSantis has been undermining the vaccination program at every step of the way. Florida is the only state in the country that under our new insane quack, Dr. Demon Seaman, Surgeon General, that advised against children getting vaccinations. And now they are advising against young men and women in general getting vaccinations, mostly young men, which is against all medical advice. It's against all medical research. So it's not surprising when you see Ron DeSantis post something that is so flagrantly false, like the old vaccine trope of getting a vaccine causes you to get the virus, which is basically what he's saying with no support or evidence. But because he said it, all the studies show that you're more likely to catch COVID with the COVID booster shot, which is false. It's complete bullshit. It's not true. There's not a single study that actually shows that. Is masterful disinformation making because he's claiming mm -hmm. that claims that not only is there proof, but he claims that all of the evidence is on his side. He doesn't have mm -hmm. to provide the papers. God knows he's not reading anything. But by claiming that he has and that all of the evidence supports his idea, he's establishing himself as A, an authority on a medical issue in which he has no expertise, knowledge, or even within the realm of possible relevancy to comment on, and that there's proof out there and that it agrees. And that this old vaccine trope of if you get vaccinated, you're going to get the flu. That's what they used to say, right. which was never true. He's created a disinformation storm. So it was fact-checked by like PolitiFact and other things, which obviously found it false. But it's very dangerous disinformation because huh. it's designed specifically to undermine vaccines. Why would someone do this? I don't know. Cindy, why do you think he would do that? I don't know. I was actually just going to ask you because it's really confusing to me because we're so far away from the kind of the hype, right? And the the height of the pandemic and even the uh, mandates, right? Like these were all things that Ron DeSantis used politically to justify attacking the vaccines. And now we're further away. I will say that I've noticed amongst a lot of the far, they are using vaccines to justify just about everybody's death, right? For instance, Diamond of Diamond and Silk, who's a far right pundit, help, you know, fa favorite of Donald Trump. Actually, Donald Trump gave her eulogy or whatever. Uh, apparently, she had been ill and hospitalized in the fall with COVID, and then now she has ha has passed away. And they turned that story and said, "Oh, actually, she died from the vaccine." But even she though was she claimed, ambassador. yeah, even though she claimed she had never gotten it. They did the same thing with Damar Hamlin and tried to claim that blunt force trauma to the chest that causes heart to go out of rhythm for a fraction of a second was somehow related to a COVID vaccine. Right. And this whole died suddenly thing, which frankly is so vile and disgusting that giving it any airtime feels 
almost gross and icky too, um, is starting to claim that young people especially are dying of cardiovascular issues as a result of the COVID-19 vaccine, even though there's no proof of that. Let's just go ahead and lots of people are dying from cardiovascular issues who get sick yeah, with COVID. COVID. Right. Yep. But people, cardiovascular injuries and illness was the number one cause of death pre-COVID. Yeah. So it's a little, <laughs> it's yeah, I know it's, uh, it's interesting because our rates of cardiovascular death as vaccinated people has actually decreased in the last several years. Whereas unvaccinated people has gone up, which again is why I say you should get boosted too, not just because we're a society and we affect other people, but if you do get sick, if you do catch it, it severely lessens the, uh, less the, of your the duration of your sickness, the intensity of it. You're far less likely to need hospitalization. There's a whole lot that goes to it. So yeah, it's important to do it. And of course they're undermining it. Now, when he did this, a year and a half ago, it made sense. Right. A couple of reporters found out that one of his major donors was the largest investor in the drug company that was making one of the treatments for if you catch COVID and you're not vaccinated. So it was, I never say it right, Remedisfer? Remedisfer? Rem yeah, Remedisfer. exactly. <laughs> Everyone yeah. knows what we're talking about. Um, yes, yeah, so it was a medication that my brother-in-law needed when he got sick who was not vaccinated and got, he worked on an offshore oil rig and everybody there got it. And with the, it was the summer. So the conditions were very physically strenuous. And so he got extremely sick. My sister's an ER nurse who's been on the front lines of COVID the whole time. She was worried he was going to die. And so he hmm. needed that treatment to save his life. And it was an effective treatment for that strain of the virus. Hmm. But then two things happened at the same time. Ron DeSantis, Mr. Pro-Vaccine, all of a sudden became anti-vaccine, and the medication that they were using, the one that starts with the R, was no longer effective against the Delta variant. But mm -hmm. he kept pushing that medication ahead of even vaccinations in, his, in the Department of Health. And so the more people who got sicker, the more people would need that medication, it would boost the sales, it would justify ordering large quantities of it, basically a kickback to a donor. Now, since that medication is no longer viable, I don't know, maybe he's got investments in hospitals now. Who the hell knows? Or in morgues. That's the business people should have gone into two years ago. I um, actually had a thought on this outside of the, yeah, these ties that we knew. I actually think that we have session coming up right, or coming on right here in Florida. Yeah. So people, the state legislators are in Tallahassee. They have a pretty extreme agenda that they're looking to pass. Yes, and is. one of the things that Ron DeSantis has done very successfully is do these culture war, these red meat things to get the base really riled up. The base is still riled up about COVID, almost like they're sad, right? <laughs> that that things are starting to get under control because it's such a popular thing to get the base here in Florida revved up about. So what I yep. think is this is a reason to get the base revved up get them excited. And it's a distraction. While Ron DeSantis in Tallahassee continues to consolidate power within his own party and then across the state legislature and the administration as well. And there's also a, an, another sinister potential element to that is that Florida failed worse than most other states with COVID-19. I think we're now third in deaths per capita. And there's no excuse for the failure when your governor, I feel like he tried to make a difference and just because of whatever reasons, staff, implementation, resources, it didn't work, you couldn't blame him, but he intentionally made it worse. He poured gasoline or more like jet fuel on a fire and that could hurt him if he ever lets go of his very authoritarian grip on that narrative that he beat it. And so... If he can keep himself front and center on COVID in the conservative landscape, because he's the only one doing it right now. Right. Most of the other ones are not talking about it as far as governors or potential presidential candidates. Then that's one way for him to try to distract from the just horrid failure that he was with COVID-19. Because he tried to rewrite history and it seems like he needs to be in the constant defense on that history or else people will see that, oh shit, he really fucked over Florida. It's part of this freedom narrative that he has too. And when he talks freedom about freedom, 
actually it is, but it's freedom from the COVID restrictions. And I can see this in conversations I'm seeing online too. It's, oh, Ron DeSantis, it's Florida is the state, the free state of Florida. And I said, what? Where wokeism what freedom? goes to die. <laughs> But what freedoms, the only freedoms that people can talk about is this, the COVID ones. Oh, we didn't have to do the mass and blah, 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 blah. It, it takes away, it allows him to perpetuate the freedom narrative if he yes. keeps that top of mind. Only so. if he can still make the argument that it worked. That was the other thing is he has always used the statistics in the data to manipulate the narrative that he didn't do any of those things and it worked. Because there are a lot of people who will be forced with the moral dilemma of, yeah, they did all that stuff and then everybody died, will not cross that road to him. But if he can make it seem like it worked, then they're more likely to be like, wait a minute, Ron DeSantis is saying that they beat COVID and he talks like they beat COVID and they didn't have to do any of those restrictions. So why did we have to? And that's, of course, he's looking at the national scale. He doesn't give a shit about Florida. No. But- Let's be very clear about one thing. Under Governor Ron DeSantis, from COVID to history books to all of the cultural terrorism that he's inflicted, it is the fascist state of Florida. Freedom goes to die. And that's really important for people to remember because I even know conservatives who like him. I know it's weird that I have friends like this. I have, there's a mayor here who I love to talk with. He's a good friend. I'm the first Democrat in his life he's ever voted for, but he's a big MAGA DeSantis guy. And he actually said to me once, he said, if I was on the opposite side of this man on something, I would be terrified. I would be terrified. And I said, now you know how I feel every single day. Like, Mm -hmm. do you think that's fair? said, because one day there might be an issue that you don't agree with. And it doesn't matter how big or how small it is or how insignificant you think you are as a mayor in a small town in the Florida panhandle. I was no one. He will do everything in his power to destroy you if you make it known that you don't agree with him, especially if you're a Republican. And uh, he said, he says, I can see why that would feel like terror. I was like, it is. For many people, it is all the time. And it's not through something that we did that was wrong. It's because we're expendable on the political landscape. And so if some of those people can start to see it, then I think he's losing his grip. Some of the more extreme and radical things he's been proposing lately, like banning Black American history in, in the AP college course, which is first of all overseen by the college board, which is a national organization and nonprofit that helps high school students receive college credit for certain types of courses based on the rigor of their curriculum. And DeSantis decided not to allow the AP Black History course this year. But um, those kinds of things will hurt him nationally. And the fact that he doesn't see that is problematic. I kind of wonder, like, he must know that he has no chance now, that, or he's completely fucking delusional. I think he's completely fucking delusional, because I think this shit is going over well. Because here's the thing, here's on this. So I just saw a clip that that DeSantis put on this. So he, first he said it had no educational value, right? So he's made a lot of people- Black history has no value in education. We don't need to know about it. It's not important. He added onto that. So he did, I don't know if it was the same press conference or another one. But he said, oh, look, they're adding queer theory in here as well. Because and black people have never been gay. And this intersectionality. <laughs> and so really, yeah. this is just like a Trojan horse for gays and transsexuals to pass their agenda on our kids. So he's covering all the bases. He came um, out. I saw the chart. I, that came out. That was via Christina Puchel. It wasn't DeSantis. Mm. And it came out several days later. When they first made the press conference, I know I unfortunately have this moral obligation to follow all the bullshit these people say. (laughs) But when he first, yeah, oh God, I'd love somebody else to do it. Your job. Um, But when he first came out with this, yeah, he did say it had no educational value. We looked at it and we don't think that it has any value. So we're not teaching it. And then it was several days later that they started to say, oh, wait, they talk about gay people. So yeah. You know, we don't want to talk about gay people or gay rights movement within black culture or anything 
any contributions of gays. No, they don't exist. We're going to pretend they don't exist. Harvey Milk, forget about that. All the gay black activists, just forget about that. They're not important. It's, I don't know who he thinks he's winning over with the anti-gay shit. Now the anti-trans shit did trend with people nationally because that was a more outlier thing. It wasn't something that everybody was introduced to or fully understood and things that are not fully understood are often met with a lot of resistance because people don't know what they are. But the United States got over like being homophobic a long time ago. Like when the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, everyone was like, eh, okay. And we just moved on. We moved the fuck on. And yeah. so to go back to that is a very bizarre thing because it, it wasn't a favorable political position any time in the last decade. It's well, been longer than that. Oh. But I think this is part, this is wrapped up in the evangelical push behind a lot of the far right agenda. Care is overwhelmingly popular across the United States as well, but that hasn't stopped Republicans from pushing to end abortion. It's yeah. because- Same with gun control, people, overwhelmingly supported and nothing happens. It's because they have these certain sects of donors and people who will rev their base for votes on these particular issues. So I think that's part of what we're seeing. Plus, I think you're right there, the using trans people, and it's a, a very nuanced topic for a yeah. very small portion of the population, but it sounds so crazy if you haven't been introduced to it, right? Yeah. So they say things like, they're letting boys in the girls' bathroom, and everybody goes, what? That's crazy. Why would you do that? And you just keep rolling and rolling on that. So yeah, you can start to sabotage things by saying, oh, it was if it's including some trans agenda, because here's the thing. There's a heck of a lot of people who are mainstream Republicans who are worried about this, this trans agenda. They, that's what they call it. There are books published on it and it's a fear mongering type of thing. But I think it's been very easily used yeah. to take control of just about any situation right now, especially when it's related to kids and education. Yeah. If you think back, even like Trump was up there waving the pride flag and said he loves the gays and his best friend, Roger Stone is openly gay, but he went hard after transgender individuals in the military and with healthcare and with a bunch of other stuff and found a way to segment those two groups from each other. And of course, if you can, what do they say? It's harder to something like tearing in half a deck of cards if all the cards are stacked together. But if you pull one out one by one, it's very easy to tear them. And there's a lot of gay people and bi people out in the world. A lot of us. If you go by the Kenzie scale, mm -hmm. then most mm -hmm. of us are on the spectrum somewhere that's not straight. Right. So when we hear homophobic stuff, odds are that somebody you're speaking to is not completely heterosexual or cares very much about someone who's not. And because the population of people who identify as transgendered is so small, they don't always have an ad advocate or an ally, and they're not always present for those conversations to personally combat that misinformation. And so mm -hmm. it's much easier to run into somebody, if you say something homophobic, it's going to get pissed off, like me because I'm bi or because my son is gay. I will just fucking lay you out. But... I've all, I know trans people, but that's just because that's, I'm in that circle. Your average mm -hmm. person probably does not, or doesn't realize that they do. Mm -hmm. So it's much harder for them to understand that these are people like everybody else that have families, that have lives, that are human beings of value, right. but they're not ever seeing it. And yeah. so I think that's a big part of it. I think it's also valuable to say within the context of this conversation is that even within the LGBT community, they're not a monolith either. In more, as we move forward, you're starting to see socioeconomic differences. You're starting to see age and generational differences. And even within that marginalized group, the transgender folks are often left out and they're invisible. The bees are always invisible. And I was about to say that if you haven't seen Bros, it's great. It's hilarious. And there's this one scene where they have their board together and they've got representatives from the non-binary, from your cis heterosexual white man, I think is the award that they give him. But, and then the trans community, the lesbian, all of it. And then there's the one bi guy and they're all getting like upset over things. So he goes, it was bisexual awareness week and not one of you acknowledged it. <laughs> and like, he keeps talking about how they're the, always the people who are missed. 
I have to admit, as a bisexual female, I've felt that my whole life. It's like, I married a man, so it confuses people. Because they're like, but you're married a man. It's like, yeah, I did. Does you think that I don't think Jennifer Lawrence is a sexy fox now? Or that, like, my list of free passes of celebrities that people make up before they actually become famous and meet celebrities didn't include women on it? Because it, it does. I'm not allowed to have that anymore. I know too many celebrities. Like, that your free pass revoked? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you turn it yeah, in too many times. Yeah, oh, if you ever run into Brad Pitt, I'd give you one free pass. And so we like would make like a list. So who's the five celebrities that if you ever meet, which we didn't think any of us would, you would get a free pass. And the Tom Hardy is on my list, and Jennifer Lawrence. And now that I'm in those circles, like I know Mark Ruffalo, and he's in the Marvel universe, which so is Spider Man in the combining Spider Man and Venom. I'm not allowed to have it anymore because <laughs> I'm not uh -huh. actually me, uh -huh. Tom Horky. <laughs> He's been number one on that list for like decades. But yeah, um, strange, strange, strange occurrences in my life. But yeah, so it's sorry to hear. Anyways, about yeah, we, we segued into the sexuality thing and then Tom Hardy being at the top of my list. But yeah, it's, I do think it's visibility, not just within the queer community, but outside of it. And where people are landing because there's also, Oddly enough, a growing contingent of LGBT Republicans I know that or Gs. Sanders <laughs> might effectively chase some of those off because not all the governors are being openly hostile to LGBT people the way that DeSantis is. And so you have a lot of your like mainstream Republicans from the Northeast or from out West. They're not engaging in this anti-LGBT oppression. That's really the only word for it. The way that yeah. DeSantis is. It's interesting. Actually, we talked a little bit about this on the Juice Fresh Talk podcast. My co-host Chantel Rhodes is a black woman and a lesbian, and she talks about this intersectionality as well and how even her herself was not somebody who was up in arms about the don't say gay bill that had passed for the education. Like I said, it's is we're getting it's these are getting into such nuanced yeah. culture war issues. And to a certain extent, like you said, it's easy to start peeling some people off because these groups are not necessarily monolithic voters or monolithic policy wise in yeah. their way. So he can say stuff and, and still get votes and support. And I think that that's probably more scary than thinking that people are going to stop supporting him. I think it's more concerning when he Until lies. A, Republic, a mainstream Republican challenges him who is not of those ideals and begins to strategically point out how those ideals are anti-American and how damaging they are and how full of shit he is. Because there are mainstream, oh, there are Republicans from the Northeast that have their eyes set on the presidency that are not anything like Ron. Larry Hogan is probably going to run. He's the former governor of Maryland, which is a heavily Democratic state. Still managed to win the governorship, which just blows my mind. But was not a COVID-19 denier at all by any stretch, is not anti-LGBT. He's one of your Romney types. That's where I would classify him as. There's like the Romney types, and then there's this new crazy batshit group. And it's on, because our ability to influence Republicans is shrinking because of that cultural divide. It's going to Romney Republicans to save their own party. And I think if you have one of those strong Romney types, he's too old now but somebody else, get on that debate stage and really press the things that DeSantis is doing wrong in the way that Galvin Newsom is doing, but from the Republican side, then he's in trouble. Because a lot of reasonable Republicans are like, I didn't sign up for this crazy shit. I just want lower taxes. They'll start to realize, wait, so you're telling me I can get the lower taxes and the deregulation. And of course, all these things that we think are awful without having to imprison Gay people. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. I don't give a shit about gay people. So that's the biggest like threat. My heart's going like this because I'm thinking of like Republican primary voters. And that's actually part of the issue. The Republican primary voters, we've seen very much over the last decade, they love the batshit crazy people because they're the most extreme part of their party and they're coming out and voting. They're not average voters. Trump was different. Trump wasn't just batshit crazy. He was a celebrity. He had this 
whole public lifetime that lured people in. People thought he was a successful businessman. I know people who are atheists who are like, yeah, I vote for him. He's run all those companies. They don't know that he ran them into the ground. Yeah, I know, right? No one remember the 90s when he was like on the cover of the Inquirer and the checkout stand at the grocery <laughs> store? I don't remember that, but <laughs> I'm not, I'm not ten years on you. But that's um, what I'm saying. Like anybody in their forties, like me, it's, that's Donald Trump has been a huckster this whole time. Yeah, but they didn't all know that. And yeah. if you think about the Republicans that they had, the last crazy one really was Reagan. Bush was like vanilla. He was meh. Everybody thought he was going to be like his dad, and he wasn't. Probably should have been Jeb, and I'm sure Jeb hates him to this day for that. But Trump was an anomaly. I think when it comes to the presidential primary, especially if the midterm elections were any indication, outside of Florida, Democrats did better than, especially in the Senate, than they've done in like 100 years. If the primaries were any indication, we're moving away from that, not towards it. But if you can control the image, it has so much peer pressure within it. If everybody's, everybody else is supporting him, so maybe I should look into it, even if they're not, then that is a very effective psychological means of getting people on your side. We just have to help them realize they've been lied to and misled, and then they'll hate him for it. I love your optimism on this, and I really, I hope <laughs> that you're right. <laughs> Everybody says it about me. Oh like, you know, it's see. very strange that someone who is kicked around as much as you have is still like walking out. Like, it's okay. The world is it's gonna save. And we're gonna save it. <laughs> and I'm like, what am that's how I grew up. And I mean, so I, I just, I mean, so uh, I'm looking at it. I'm, I'm now stepping into the Sarah Connor mode of the, <laughs> the Terminator, right? And I'm like, all right, I got to get in the gym. I got to get some arms training. I'm down here in Southwest Florida too. And that's where I, we were talking. One of the things that we saw on Twitter is my new neighbor here in Southwest Florida is Madison Cawthorn. And he's already making such nice friends with all of the Michael Flynn operatives in our new- on. Yeah, yeah QAnon, Republican Party folks. And yeah, so I'm like, all right, I got to get my training. I got to learn how explosives work, whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the hell is going on with that, but he got kicked out of his own party. So I don't see him revising his career. And I feel like anything could happen in Florida, especially here. I, I Florida is bizarre. And we should mention this too, because this happened this past week. So Andrew Warren was an elected official from Hillsborough County who was removed from his position illegally by Ron DeSantis for co-signing a letter saying he would not imprison women who received abortions. He would not be prosecuting that as a crime. And he sued. And the decision came out yesterday, the day before. And the judge said that DeSantis absolutely broke the law. It was a violation of his First Amendment rights, and it was a violation of Florida state constitution. However, as a federal court, they did not have the authority to reinstate a public official in the state of Florida. Now, of course, DeSantis's misinformation machine has already started lying about this, saying that the judge affirmed DeSantis's termination of him and backed him up, which is false. It is absolutely false. They did the same shit to me. The FCHR investigation found that the state broke the law in instructing me to hide, manipulate, delete data. But since I was fired the day after I asked for instructions on how to file a whistleblower complaint, I could not have been fired for filing the whistleblower complaint because they fired me first. So... They do this and it is manipulative. It's a lie. And we could probably have a show that just looks at every, all the bullshit coming out of DeSantis's office yeah. every week. It's very scary when a person who's an elected official, the people elected to this power, to this office can just be removed without consequence. When you say anything's possible in Florida now, the precedent that this sets, it truly is. And yeah. that should piss off everyone because if you vote for someone, that's the person you picked to that elected representative official. Right. Like ma people picked Matt Gates here. That sucks. It sucks. But I'm not going to go around saying there was election fraud or something like that. It just sucks. It sucks. But that's the yeah. person that they picked. I don't think that I should be able to go to a governor and say, you should just remove him anyways, unless he goes to jail. 
that's something, but just because that's not how this works. That's, that is the antithesis of a republic of voting in a democracy. If you can just remove someone. So this is actually what I was getting at when I said this is the, actually the scariest part about Ron DeSantis is that because he's in control, there's no one to check him. And he's placed people in the judiciary. He's placed people across the administration. He's got a super majority in the legislature, and he controls his party. Okay. They yep. only do his agenda. That's what comes to the floor. And he's playing pay for play for a whole bunch of things, just like he did with the congressional maps and Senator Ray Rodriguez, who's now the president of the board of governors. Okay. That yep. was a hundred percent rollover Ray. Give me my map. Okay. Which by the way, that was four Republican seats and that's what they, the Republican yep. majority has now in Congress. So it had a huge consequence and that's what the power the has. Congress that will be in place when he runs for president. Sure. And that will make what happened in 2020 look like a practice run because this time the Republicans will have the House of Representatives. They did not last time. And people who missed that and did not realize what was in front of them with that well, let's just say we warned him. We're trying. And so, but Ron DeSantis has been doing this across the state. I think the Warren case is a, a very salient because he's actually going through the legal process and trying to be reinstated. But we also have the Broward school board member. Yeah. And that man was removed because of a 30-year-old felony, even though he went through the process to have his rights restored to vote. Ron DeSantis determined that that was not the same as the rights restored to run, yep. which was new to everyone, by the way, because <laughs> there's nothing that the might process. actually get overturned, though, because my Our case opinion. actually became a precedent now that's been cited many times. This sham candidate who's never lived in my district decided to primary me and some DeSantis people changed my voter registration, like in Maryland, a year before I was running to NPA and thought that would screw me over so I couldn't run as a Democrat and waited until after the qualifying and everything to reveal this, even though they've been sitting on it for a year. But the Florida Supreme Court ruled in a 3-0 decision, and these are all three DeSantis appointees, that the letter of the law must be enforced and nothing can be inferred from it. So if it does not specifically state that in the statute, they cannot assume that's what is meant when the law was enacted. Otherwise, it would say so. And I was looking at the school board members. He needs to use my case as a precedent because there's nothing in the law that says that there is a separate process from getting your rights restored after going through the entire... There's an actual term. The qualification. Yeah. There's a term for what it... I'm trying to remember what it was. For when you go through the process of getting your rights back after a felony, but it doesn't actually specify a separate process. So under the letter of the law, you cannot expect someone to have to assume a different process. But if it goes to federal court, they're going to say the same thing. We can't reinstate an elected official in state or county government in the state of Florida. I don't know. Yeah. But I, so I, what I'm saying though, is this is something that we should be paying attention to because yes. it happened not once but twice. And it, it's, this is a theme. This is a pattern. And he knows that he's protected because of the separation of powers, frankly. Yeah. That the state and the federal laws, they have to play together, but that it's really difficult actually to overturn things that are happening in the state. When it comes to elections, absolutely. Because the separation of federal and state elections is so like hard line that they're not going to cross in and say, I would be worried about any federal court that was deciding for in a state who's their elected official. That goes both, it, either way, it's a bad situation. You would just hope that you wouldn't have a governor who's such a fucking asshole that he starts removing elected officials so that it comes to this point. But that's the situation that he's put our people in. And I think we should all be pissed off about that. Yeah, we should. Okay. That's well, what we'd be pissed off about. So now we got our COVID and our Ron DeSantis diatribe over. What else is going on in terms of misinformation and disinformation? Ron DeSantis's vaccine lies were my misinfo story or disinfo story of the week. We talked a little bit about his machine against Andrew Warren, falsely claiming that the judge held DeSantis's decision would 
actually did the complete opposite. It said, no, this was illegal. I just lack the authority to take the necessary steps to provide the relief, which is the opposite of upholding it. Um, Not upholding. So there's a lot around DeSantis coming out. I'm sure I've read a few things here and there. But we're doing a team up. We can announce. Oh, right. no, this will be coming after the. Uh, oh, it'll be before. Never mind. Because Wednesday night, I'm doing a team up with the Krasenstein brothers, Mueller, she wrote, and a couple of other people. I've never done Twitter spaces before. So this is my first time. It'll be super chill. But in other news, I am actually going to Yale University in a couple of weeks to speak at an event that they're holding there. And perhaps moving into New Haven permanently in the next six months, we will see. But I PhD, but I'm super excited to go because one of the things that we'll talk about or that I'll talk about is disinformation, how the government retaliates against whistleblowers. Apparently I've become the relevant the of, yeah. government retaliation against whistleblowers. Yeah, it's like government retaliation against scientists, whistleblowers, and people just hold on my picture. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> what are you going to do? But I've spoken to classes there two years in a row now. So I'm actually mm -hmm. getting to go there and do this whole thing, which is super cool. And Yale is obviously Yale, and it's also where Ron DeSantis went. I'm going to bring some sage, clear out the demon spirits that Ron DeSantis left behind. And we'll, this place is clean. Make sure that it's uh, nice and safe. So that's exciting. And we're starting to mobilize our pack, which is Saving America 2024. Yes, nice. it is a play on words of Trump Save America 2024, but the dumbass didn't reserve all of the different variations of that. So guess what? We've got Saving America 2024. And um, we are going hard after the currently elected officials up for re-election. So it's a federal pack. All of the people in the House and a handful of the senators who are up for election that voted against certifying the 2020 election. Oh. And making sure that we do everything in our part to see those people be defeated. I'm going to have some data dashboards built about which seats are most vulnerable and why, how we're utilizing the money that we're fundraising to most efficiently target those races. Obviously, it's early, so a lot of those house races don't have a clear opponent yet. But as mm -hmm. that information comes in over the next year, we'll make sure that we're adding it and that we're letting people know who the candidates are, how they can support them, giving our own support doing a lot of dominating on social media. We're talking about multimedia projects, videos, instructionals, all kinds of stuff to help candidates, to help inform the public, direct mailing to what we see as gettable moderate conservatives. So, you know, what Cambridge Analytica did, but legal and for good. Nice. <laughs> so you that can check good. out that at savingamerica2024.org. We're still flushing out the site. So, you know, there's some stuff that we're loading on there with maps and data. We'll get more as we get further into the election season, as you say, because we just got off of one. So it's going to be yeah. probably a year until kind of we really get to see who we're going to have to pick from. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, we can do a lot of damage to these people and by sharing their record and making sure voters are informed about every stupid, horrible, awful, lying thing that they do. So if you can donate, that would be great. We are registered FEC PAC, and uh, Dr. Cindy Banya is on our board, along with Verde, who is a veteran political director for Joe Biden's campaign in 2020, for right. Nikki Fried's campaign, for his Charlie Chris campaign, for, he's just a superstar. So we're lucky to have him too. But, uh, so there's that too. So check it out. Yeah, that's a lot of good stuff. And it's a lot about, yeah, fighting this information and getting the record straight because what we've found, and now I've found myself because I'm doing these podcasts with Rebecca every week. I'm ta I'm telling people what I heard and what she's told me. I've learned so much about our the problems with our local media and the ghost operations and things that I don't even think we're top of mind in my understanding of these, the way that we get information. I was seeing it. I was seeing it, but I didn't understand it. So I think it's so important that we're doing this work and that we're tuning into this podcast because there's a lot of information. And if there's nobody out there providing the counterpoint, we are all in for a world of trouble. Yep. And every bit counts. And I'm the optimist. So I will always be fighting. I'm the pragmatist. I'm an optimist too, but I'm a pragmatist. And sometimes I'm sitting here. She'll be here telling me, okay, yeah, but let's not get our hopes up. <laughs> like, 
oh my gosh, what are these folks doing? That's exactly what I did when I saw those Madison Cawthorn pictures come out this week. I'm like, what are they doing? I'm trying to figure it out because that is so much of what's going on in Florida is is not right for a corruption bust on par with Chicago and even what Louisiana went through to just completely destroy all of those mechanisms. It would take a very brave federal prosecutor, but we've done it in other places before. There's no reason we can't do it now. And I think that's why providing the information about it is really necessary because it's just not there. There, there is so much stuff that's getting sweeped under, swept under the rug here in Florida, like it's nothing. And you've already touched on it, and I know we're going to keep touching on it more. But these Russia connections too are are just. You take one second to look at what's going on in these different connections and these financiers, and you have to be wondering, like, at what point are people really going to start to be concerned about this? Because it's, we've been manipulated, we've been lied to, and the foreign influence on Florida politics is absolutely insane. It is. And it's also a quite isolating feeling when you post something online and then a horde of bots that disagrees with you or is pro-Russia starts or pro-DeSantis starts flooding you. But just remember, most of those accounts are managed by a very small number of people. And it's meant to look, make you feel like that you're the only one who feels that way, but when in fact the reality is opposite. Again, the midterm elections, all of the social media was talking about a red wave and how Republicans were going to blow through the Senate and get all these seats. And look, they didn't, they lost because those bots are not real people. They can't vote. A lot of them probably don't even live in this country. Don't let the noise make you question what you know is real because it's strategic and it's frustrating and it can be confusing, but it's done to make you feel disenfranchised in more ways than one. And apathetic so. and not vote. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so that is our episode. Don't feel, that is an optimistic thing. So don't feel left out. You're there. We're going to keep providing this information. We're going to keep fighting. And Rebecca's going to be out there. And I'm here helping to support it all to make sure that everybody's getting the information they need so that we can fight back against this growing authoritarianism here in Florida. That's right. And we will see you guys next week to do it all over again. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us here at Miss Informational with Miss Informational herself, Rebecca Jones. And, and Dr. Our, Cindy Banyai. Okay, Dr. Cindy Banyai. And you can listen to this on our website, BigMouthMediaFL.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to see the video and all of the content we have, you're, we would love to have you subscribe to Big Mouth Media dot com big mouth media fl.com and we have for a limited time just another week we have our foundation membership available fifty dollars forever all of the content but it's going to change it's going to change so get in those foundation memberships before february 1st and get your fuck matt gates and all those other traders t-shirts oh, right those awesome shirt <laughs> That Rebecca, she designed those Fuck Matt Gate shirts, and we got the really sexy version or just the regular t-shirt. Lots of great stuff on the Big Mouth Shop. Check it out. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye.